Um, and we're back in Leadership Dojo practice time. I'm Alta Starr and delighted to be here with you for an exploration today of sites of shaping and change. And as, as we always do, I think we want to just start off by getting present. And I realize that um, in this group of folks and more people are joining us by the moment, there are a number of people who have not taken somatics courses or embodied leadership, embodied transformation courses. So some of this may seem a, a little unusual or the language I'm really trying to adjust to think about the simplest way of introducing some of the concepts as well as practices. But in essence, um, this somatics methodology, this methodology of embodied transformation is really all about coming home to our whole beings and to the powerful and ancient wisdom that lives in our bodies. And I really don't say that from a place of um, kind of new age romanticism when I say ancient, but I mean the bodies that each of you are sitting in in this moment um, has four billion years of evolution behind it. And that's no joke. And there's actually a way that so much of what we feel, what we think, what we do is informed by that long, long, long lineage of evolutionary development. So when I say ancient wisdom, that's really what I'm referring to. And the more conscious and aware and intentional we can get about being in these miraculous organisms, the more access we have to that wisdom. That's a large part of what somatics is about. What I would add, in addition to coming home to the body, coming home to that wisdom, that there is also a process of, it's how we do it, that the transformative process is one of just coming more and more into that through practice, through something that we call opening, which is about the release of long-held contractions. Um, and then finally, through just the expanded and ever-developing awareness that is part of the process. We actually move from what we could call our current or historical shape. Here it is. It's three minutes after 11 on the morning of July 14, 2020. And whoever you are in this moment, you can think of as your historical shape. And probably many of you are on this call. I know that I am a practitioner and a, an ongoing student in this methodology because of the longings that I have for more life, for greater effectiveness, for more connection, for a changed society, for a more powerful leadership. All those longings are constantly drawing me towards a different shape what in our lingo we call the new shape. And there's a process or an arc, as probably you have discussed in, here in the dojo or will, where we move from old or historical current shape to new shape through a range of experiences. It's not linear, it's not predictable, but we can describe the stages even if they don't actually happen one after the other. So, sites of shaping, sites of change, is how we got to this historical shape, in addition to whatever our particular genetic lineage may be, what we landed on the planet with at that moment of birth or moment of conception, a lot of other things happen to give us the shape we have. The world lives in our bodies, and that's the exploration we're in today. Um, but before going there, at the heart of this methodology, at the heart of this transformative process, actually what exists there is centering. And 
I really love talking about it as centering, as this process. All of us either were in the process of coming home to ourselves, coming home to center, to presence, to really being alive and aware in this moment in time, fully in our bodies, fully in connection with our feelings and connected to what we care about. So therefore having agency and choice about the actions we take or we're not. We're drifting away from that place or very far away from it because we've been grabbed by some particular form of pressure or we've just lost touch. So we're either moving towards center, centering or somewhere else. So every single practice, everything almost that we do, there'll be a reference to center, centering, an exploration of that. So let's start there. We start off by just noticing what is. We're gonna be in a process now of coming into this moment. So what's the first thing? Well, let's get clear about what is here. So I want to invite you to drop your attention into the level of sensation, into your bodies. Find a sensation. Sensations are things like temperature, warmth or coolness, pressure, tension, movement. There's sensation in your body, but also our sensory awareness is part of our sensory, sensory perception. So just notice, huh, what can you hear? What can you taste or smell? What's in your visual field? And what's happening in you? Just taking stock of all that. One of our little proverbs, you know, is that there is no way to more quickly come into the present moment than to bring awareness to the level of sensation. If you put your awareness on your beating heart or the pulse that perhaps you can feel in your fingertips or your throat, you might stop worrying or you know having those circular obsessive thoughts that we can all get into sensation. Also, just take a check, take stock of your mood. What's the emotional weather in you in this moment? And take stock of the quality of your thinking. Is your mind racing along or is it slowing down? Is it sluggish? Is it clear like a bright open sky, or maybe it's a little muddy. Just notice. We're not changing anything because right now we're being in a practice of truly accepting what is. I like to say we're ending our war with reality. That's what this practice is which is actually a, usually a war with ourselves that we then just turn extra. So noticing and saying yes to what is. First step. We then begin to organize ourselves on purpose. We're using our intention to say, I choose to really be alive here and able to make choices that will serve what I care about. The first step, if you're whether you're seated or standing, I am seated. I have a, a bad knee that's been acting up. But whether you're seated or standing, and part of the argument for standing is it can allow you to feel more. But line your body up so that your feet are parallel and about hip width apart. Your knees are over your ankles. 
if you're seated, you're really, you can feel those sit bones on the chair. And your spine is lined up over your pelvis, over your, over your sacrum. Your neck is right above at the end of that spine and your head is, is nicely relaxed on your neck. Your chin is neither dropped by your, down to your chest like this. And everybody that can see me, just do that. Just drop your head for a minute. Just notice what that feels like. And then lift it and actually lift your chin a little, like tilt it up. And some of us walk through the world like this. So just notice what feelings, what else changes in your body. Then bring your chin level with the floor. Stacking your body. One part right above the other. We also check in this stage for the places where lots of us hold tension. So just notice what's happening around your eyes. You might want to even kind of squeeze them shut and squint or hold them really wide open. Both of which are ways that sometimes we are and then let them relax. Jaw is another band in which many of us hold tension. Everybody tighten your jaw. Tight, tight, tight. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. Notice what else tightens. Notice what mood happens with that and then let go. You may want to yawn. Oh. Stretching your jaw and letting in a little more oxygen. Yeah. In the other places, your throat, your shoulders, just wherever you can, just notice, huh, there's some, there's some tension here or there's an absence. I'm not feeling anything here. If there's tension, gently invite relaxation. If there's absence, gently, compassionately invite your awareness there. From here, dropping your breathing down into your body, meaning taping, taking fuller and fuller breaths. Really letting your chest rise and fall. Feeling your diaphragm moving up and down. And you may want to put a hand on your belly. And when we suggest this, you're putting your thumb in your navel so that your palm falls on your lower belly. And in many traditions, well, first let's start with the, your center of gravity is right there behind your palm. And in many traditions around the world, this is in, in a place of attention, a place of, it's considered the, place, the source of the life, life force. So just breathing so that your belly rises and falls, your breath rises and falls, and you're bringing more awareness more aliveness, more of yourself into that bowl of your lower belly, that pelvic bone, and really filling it out. We're not talking about one tiny point. We're talking about the full area, hip to hip, from the front of your pelvis back to your sacrum, filling it up with you and your life. From this place, we center in length. And essentially, centering in length means surrendering to gravity, really letting gravity have your weight, while at the same time, allowing your upper body to be more spacious and possibly upright. Not all of us can be upright, but whatever our shapes and our bodies, we can fully occupy them. So from the tip of your tailbone to the top of your head, inviting space. Centering in length, that's what we're doing. Balancing upper and lower halves of the body and actually accessing dignity your unquestionable, inherent, innate right to exist. Your innate and unquestionable worth. Just check inside. 
huh? Can you have a taste of that in this moment? An embodied taste of dignity. We next center in with, which essentially is balancing, bringing aliveness and awareness to the left and right sides of the body. It can be a little bit of unfurling, folding out like a book opening. Because often we're cramped and closed in, if folks can see what I'm doing. So you're letting yourself fill out from side to side. You're really feeling your edges on the sides, whether it's the outside of your legs, the sides of your torsos, the side of your left arm and right arm, the right and left ear or cheeks. Those boundaries, those edges. And with each breath, just inviting yourself to, to fill it in. Fill in to your edges and begin to explore the question of, huh, well, where do I stop and start? Another little proverb that we'll talk about is boundaries are where we begin, not where we end. There's something to muse on. And notice if there's any place in your body that does feel pulled in, scrunched in towards your midline. You know, it might be across your hips maybe, or maybe it's your chest, or maybe it's your throat. Maybe it's up in your head. If you find such a place, with a couple of breaths, just invite it to be in a relaxed fullness. And if there's some part of you that's just way spilling over your edges, that actually kind of, you know, in a forced bigness, notice if you can invite that to come into a relaxed balance size with the dimension of belonging, of interdependence, the place where we access our right to take up right-sized space, not too much, not too little. So see again, if you can have a taste of, oh yes, I'm in my fullness and I feel my belonging by exploring this dimension of your physical body. Third dimension, depth, volume, front to back. We can start inside. We've already put some attention there. Find your heartbeat. And again, that doesn't have to be at your physical heart. Your, your pulse is moving through your whole body. Where can you feel it? I'm often aware of my pulse at my fingertips. Where do you feel yours? Let your awareness, your experience of your own pulse pull you more into the inside of your body. So just notice what you can feel. Inside. There is so much going on in the body. Your nervous system is doing its work. Your circulatory system, your digestion is working. Kidney, spleen, liver. All the time without you telling them what to do. So I like to think of this inner exploration in a way as bringing some appreciative curiosity to all that activity that is you. So just notice. And with each breath, see if you can invite a little more space between the front and back of your body. 
as a way of making more space for all that action. A little attention on the back of your body. Notice if you can feel the air, your hair, your clothes, your chair, anything that just kind of anchors you in the sensation of, oh yeah, that's my back. Often we forget that we have backs. It can be deliciously relaxing to just put awareness there. And a little bit on the space behind you. Metaphorically, on what's behind you? What's at your back? Where have you come from? That lineage that we were talking about. All that. Give it a moment of attention. Then bringing your awareness to the front of your body. Same thing. What can allow you to attend to it? A sensation on your face, your clothes, maybe it's your toes. And just notice often our fronts have a lot of contraction, tightness, hardness, armor. Just notice, huh, is there some place on the front of your body that feels contracted and that you can invite to relax just 10%? Here's a third proverb. <laughs> a relaxed body is a powerful body. Relaxing the front of your body may allow you to be more ready for whatever you're facing into, whatever is ahead, all those unknowns that the future holds. So the third dimension is really a dimension of presence from the inside out, fully occupying your body in this moment with an awareness of what's behind you, and an openness to what's ahead. The very last dimension of the centering process is the dimension of commitment. What do you care about? You've been in this methodology for a while, then you have a commitment statement. Maybe you don't have any idea what that is, but nonetheless, there are things that you have chosen to put your life energy into. There are things that you are up to with your life, those things that matter to you. Bring whatever's top of heart to mind, to body in this moment. And if you have a commitment, say it to yourself. And imagine that it is filling you throughout all the dimensions of length, of width, of depth, every single cell of your body. Because that commitment, that care, that concern, that priority is what and who you are. And then take a moment, we're completing the centering process, but really stay with that and notice what your mood is. And come to your computer still holding all of that and just take a moment and look, scroll through these pages and notice all the centered, committed folks with whom you're sharing space. And I invite people, one of the strange things about being present on Zoom, right? It's real easy to not be present. So move your eyes, your gaze softly between looking at the screen and looking at the lens. When we look at the lens, we're allowing people to see us and to see us seeing them. When we look at the screen, you're seeing the people you're with. Just 
scroll through, see the dignity, see the width and belonging. Notice the sense of presence, most of all, the depth of commitment. Clearly, given that there are, at this point, 310 folks on this call, we are not going to do a go-round to do a mood check. <laughs> so just notice for yourself, huh, how are you now after that process of century? And you do want to be in a practice in our courses. Um, I've taught some with generative somatics, some with Strozzi, some with Bold, Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity. And in courses, you know, we'll always say to folks, okay, your homework, practice centering three to five days, three to five times a day. Yes, Salonis made a note. You can put your mood in the chat. You can drop it in if you want to so that others can see it. I do know that when we do that, that will go pretty fast if people do it, but you'll get to get some sense of how folks are doing. And I see just from a couple that I noticed, one of the most important things about centering, and I really hope all of you remember this like a mantra, we don't center to feel good. We don't center to feel calm and relaxed. We center to feel and feel more. We center to honor our aliveness by allowing and experiencing every single drop of it. The bitter and the sweet, the angry and the loving, the joyful, the grieving, whatever's there. We center to build a container that can experience all of that and let it move through us without having to act out, act in, be caught in reaction, as opposed to choice and agency. So when we say we center to be present, to be open to ourselves and others, to be connected to ourselves and others and what we care about, getting more nuanced, that's what we mean. We, we center to be present with our full aliveness. And it may not feel good. But there is such deep and profound satisfaction in feeling alive. So that was a long centering, the first part of this call, the first part of our practice dojo. I do want to move us into sites. So what is up with this sites of shaping? Um, our societies, our worlds, our landscapes, all of that live in our bodies and people are discovering more and more about that as time goes on but you know simple examples some of you i suspect are old enough to be from uh that period when babies in hospitals were tagged with pink and blue blankets folks know what i'm, know what I'm talking about a few of you got to see some nods I don't think they do that anymore, thank God. But there was a time, a newborn infant, boy, girl, pink, blue. You think, well, what's wrong with that? There's a whole many, 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 many things written about the gender binary. But let's just keep it simple. You know, research psychologists, uh, <laughs> I find it fascinating the things they study. But one of the things they studied was, well, what happens when adults think they know a child's gender. And here they are interacting with an infant in a blanket or a, a onesie that's one color or the other. Across the board, the babies were treated differently. The, the babies in blue, much more physical interaction, lifting and kind of throwing and really engaging with some rough and tumble. The babies in pink blankets, Oh, you're so pretty, much more soothing, much more about smiling. Y'all know where I'm going, right? That is shaping. That is shaping from the earliest moments, from initial breaths. People are being shaped 
to be the way that their societies dictate they should be based on gender. We don't leave a lot of room for angry, rough, rough and tumble girls or gentle, maybe weeping, emotional, sensitive boys. Social construction. Now, obviously I'm not erasing biology with this, but I am really trying to emphasize how much shaping has impacted all of us. So there's that kind of shaping. There's shaping, obviously, around race. There's now language, in fact, in the U.S. and other places where we talk about people being white bodied. That all that gets taught about what it is to be white lives in people's bodies. I am less familiar with that, although I have some insights into it, but I can talk about some of what lives in black bodies and give an example. All of you just went through um, a centering process with me. Well, one of the times early on, and some of you have heard this, I apologize, but it is, I think, such a powerful example of what lives in bodies. So early on, when I was starting to teach somatics and teaching in bold, our very first course in 2012, Penn Center, South Carolina, it's, um, it's a res, um, what do you call it, a retreat center that was one of the first schools for uh, freed Africans post-slavery. Um, and it's still, people still use it today as a retreat center to teach. So here we are, we've got 30 black social justice leaders from around the United States. And there we are first morning, I'm teaching centering. Okay, relax into your body, blah, blah, blah. You all know the steps. We get to length and say, take some breaths, really let your spine relax, feel yourself. And one of the participants, a tall, probably six foot five, 250 pound man, passed out. Terrified me, terrified the rest of the training team. We hadn't had that happen. And of course, we were all pretty new then to teaching somatics. Like, oh my God, what have we done? But he was fine. And he, re he regained his consciousness in a few moments and said he was fine. But the next day, after he had spent some time thinking about it that night, after he had had a conversation with his mother, he was able to tell us a long distance call from South Carolina to where she was. He came in and he said, you know, that I was over six feet tall by the time I was 13 years old. So this is an old story for me. I thought I just happened eight years ago and it's a story that I've told many times. And yet still I can, so much feeling, I center to feel. Um, Sadness, anger. Anyway, he had grown up in Birmingham, Alabama. And if you know anything about Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama was nicknamed Bombingham during the Civil Rights Movement. It's a place where the 16th Street Church was bombed, killing the little girls, the church that Angela Davis and her family were affiliated with shaping. Now, of course, shaping can work different ways. Someone else shaped by that period, that incident was Condoleezza Rice. So no telling where people go. But the point is both of those shapes include reactions to that history. This man's body included his need to be smaller, to shrink himself. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. I mean, you know, there was a time, right, where in the South and in segregation, Black Americans, Black folks were expected to keep their heads down and never make eye contact. You could have your head up and still shrink your length and your dignity for the sake of surviving. So when he was invited to relax and be in his full length, as he put it, he said, my body just it didn't know what to do. I got lightheaded. Those muscles, those powerful muscles, the lats and the other muscles that we all have in our backs, had so much contraction from so many years of being smaller that it was just 
cognitive dissonance, embodied dissonance, he fainted. That's how sights live in our bodies. That is an experience of many black bodies in a society that threatens our lives. Not having to ever experience that, experiencing some degree of feeling, oh, I'm safe, I belong, kind of what we call the settler colonial mentality, right? That says the world's mine, I have a right to all of it. It's those guys on the New York subway that sit with their legs spread really apart, right? That's kind of a certain kind of colonialism. Boom, the seat is mine. Those are shapings. Those are things that have been shaped by social conditions. What I'd like to do is to actually share a slide with you. Uh, I'm going to do a share screen here for a moment. Oops, the host disabled screen sharing. So, uh, Antonio or Salonis, can you, I don't know if you can make me a host since I'm not a, um, oh, great. They just did it. Ah, magic. All right, here we go. Yeah, sites of shaping, sites of change. We can think of ourselves, our little individual beings, our bodies, our somas, as, you know, inside a whole bunch of nesting dolls. And each layer is shaped by the layers beyond. They're interpenetrating, right? There's our family, our intimate network, the place that we are at our youngest from that moment that we come on the planet and we used to get a pink or blue blanket <laughs> right but all those folks that surround us early on and even as adults we have intimate networks they're the people that are closest to us or we can think about teenagers and you know proverbial peer pressure intimate network how is that shaping values actions body Community. Community can mean neighborhood, but it can also mean community of shared interests, community of shared experience, right? Beyond that are institutions, the actual structures, in a sense, of society, the school system, police, army, medical system. All those institutions which interact and create conditions in which we live. The huge conversation, well, I don't know if it's a huge conversation, but the conversation about why we have diff racially determined differential health outcomes. Things are happening at the level of institutions that are impacting people's bodies. What, what shapes how the institutions are? Well, obviously history. History, social norms, historical forces. And beyond all of that, there's landscape. And beyond that, what in some ways is untouched by the human, kind of the transhuman, the big mystery out there. So we just want to acknowledge and bow to that. But I do want to say something about landscape. I live in New York City. We have a saying in New York City, a New York minute. I was reflecting on how that pace, you know, there is a pace. New Yorkers can move fast, talk fast, think fast, make decisions fast, boom, boom, boom. And kind of with a, there's a way that, that New Yorkers navigate just being with other people where it's like, okay, get with it, get with it, come on now. And I realized, huh, you know what? We don't see the horizon much in New York City, in Manhattan. It is very different from the experience that folks might have on an island. I think about spending time in St. Kitts, and St. Kitts has a slogan, hurry slowly. You know, it's a Caribbean island. It's a very different rhythm. What does it mean to be able to look off in the distance and actually see the sea and sky meet? What is the shape, what does that produce in a body about having time to reflect, having time to do things in a leisurely way, making choices, moving more slowly, listening, as opposed to living in a place where the streets are crowded, where there's lots of traffic, where you don't see the sky, the sky is chopped up 
by the tall buildings and their roofs, roofs, etc., etc., etc. Landscape, landscape which we interact with and shape, but then which shapes us back, right? Um, so the, I think the question, what I want to invite people into right now for a moment is to think about your own shaping. We are not going to be able, given the size of the call, to move into groups, but people can share reflections. Well, actually, why don't we do this? Let's start with any questions, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> questions or comments? Just drop it in the chat box. Okay, there, yes, Salonis. Thank you, Salonis. <laughs> We're on the same wavelength here. Okay, a lot of sense. Okay, all right. I'm going to invite you for a moment to, um, let's stay with the gender gender shaping if people are okay with that for a moment just think about for a moment some way that your experience of gender was shaped by your family you don't have to share it just reflect on it and more than reflect on it see if you can feel that shaping and maybe it's shaping that you've come to some awareness about and chosen to change but notice where it is in your body. Maybe it was things you were taught about being ladylike. Or maybe it was things that you were taught about what boys do or don't do. But just notice. And maybe something that in you that was shaped, again, we're looking for the feeling for what's in the body. So sorry. I should have cut my cell phone off. I apologize for that. <laughs> yeah. But some way that your intimate network as an adolescent shaped your experience of gender. Hi, Alta. Yes. We have some questions in the chat that are coming up. Okay. Uh, so one question is from Patricia Albert, and uh, she says, what can we do right now to support everyone being met with dignity and respect? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thelonis. I also want to note, Jennifer Berry, I see your comment as well. Nothing like, uh, nothing like some John Coltrane <laughs> on, a, on a Wednesday morning. What could we do to meet everyone with dignity and respect? Uh, where is, what was the person's name that asked the question? And where is she? Can I, can we- Patricia, can you come off of mute? Hi. Hello, Patricia. Hi, Alta. Yes. Um, I guess for me, one of the questions that just comes up is, what have you tried? Well, um, I find everybody interesting and I try to listen to, you know, everyone's story. I'm quite moved by uh, some of the stories you were telling earlier, Alta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think we're at, we're at a, a place where we could all do something more, maybe to really reach out and understand. Yes. Well, one suggestion that I have, um, and it's almost the parallel of what we are up to in organizations like BOLD, which obviously serves black social justice leaders, but one thing is to actually explore your own deep shaping, what is deeply embodied in you as a result of your life experiences, and to explore it with people like you. I saw that someone had dropped in the chat 
saying that they would be interested in connecting with other white bodied people for exploration of that. But the more awareness and when I say acceptance, I don't mean acceptance in the sense of, oh, that's just fine, that's a good thing, but acceptance as in, yes, this is true. It is true that I have experienced this privilege or this way of being, and I now choose to do something differently rather than to be unconscious with it, right? But we never start off with this kind of, oh, I hate that about myself and I'm going to get rid of it, because first of all, it doesn't work. The things that live in our bodies are in our bodies, so we start there. We start there with, yes, this is here, this is part of me, and I'm adding these other ways of being. Um, the more that we can be in a certain kind of compassionate and accountable dignity, the more we actually are able to offer that to others and to let others have that as well. I do think that the accountability piece is critical, and it's not a word that I like. I wish there were another word. But what I mean here is most of us will tend, when confronted with privilege, um, I mean, I can, well, yeah, most of us can, can either go into a place of, not me, I'm not the one doing that. Now, some people who look like me might do that, but I don't do that. Or we can go, to, oh, I'm so awful. Oh. I'm so terrible. Just total shame and breakdown. Either we, you know, just collapse or we fend off. A centered place, being in that powerful, strong, vertical line of acknowledging. Yes. For example, for me, it feels so weird to feel embarrassed, but I'm straight, okay? I live in a world that has many folks who are not straight, many of my, my folks. And there are certain privileges that come with that. There is a process that we've done in, in courses um, inside of generative somatics where everybody gets paired up just for the, the practice. It doesn't matter straight or queer, but you have a partner. But then some of the couples are assigned straight identities and some are assigned queer identities. And all the folks who have a straight identity walk around and break the hand clasp of the folks who have queer identities. Because essentially, that's what it is to be queer and live in a world that privileges and prioritizes straight, straightness, heterosexuality, not being able to marry as opposed to being able to marry, not being able to be with your loved one when he or she is dying, as opposed to being, of course, invited to. So what does it mean to have social norms, historical forces, institutions, everything structured for it okay, for it to be okay for a girl and a boy to get together, but not a boy and a boy or a girl and a girl. And what does it mean as someone, again, growing up hetero, to acknowledge that privilege, to be accountable for it, to say, yes, it's true. That's really different in my experience, without shame and without denial. That's the practice that we want to be in. Presence. Again, it all comes back to centering and what we care about. Is that helpful? Thank you, Alta. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, Salonis, Salonis, I wasn't tracking. I don't know if there was another question. Uh, yes, we have some questions about the outer circles, um, about landscape in particular. And I also want to, there, there are two people asking questions about this. One is um, how do we connect with the non-human form and the ecological devastation? And the other is like, how do we reshape our larger reins uh -huh. um, towards great. our commitments? Great, 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 great. Um, so I'll start by talking a little bit about the ecological and then I wanna go back to the slide for a moment. Um, and this is actually also related to the larger social levels um, if people are aware of or have read Joanna Macy's work, for example, um, there are other, what they call the deep ecology, deep feminist ecology, the, the, that kind of tradition. Um, there is something about being with, being able to be with the emotions that are related to what's happening on earth to the planet beyond the human. But even beyond that, 
at the level of our livingness, our actual aliveness, the more that we can cultivate that, the more porous, sensitive, and responsive we can be to those conditions, to what's happening. And this is also tied to empowerment, and it's a little bit to the question around how do we deal with social structures, right? That in the same way that I said, we don't center to feel good or calm. We center to feel our aliveness. The more deeply we connect with our aliveness, in a sense with our wholeness, the more ready we become, the more empowered to actually engage those things that get in the way of aliveness for ourselves and others. It's a little bit, you know, I think of, um, there's a quote from um, uh, Martin Luther King, and it's that uh, justice is power correcting everything that stands against love. It's another proverb that I think is worth contemplation. We could talk about aliveness truly being the vehicle for us to be, to struggle for justice, to struggle to correct everything that stands against life. Because life doesn't have any other agenda except living. Life doesn't have any other agenda except expanding. Often that happens in distorted and destructive ways. It doesn't have to of necessity. So how do we become so integrated between our emotions what's happening in our bodies, our thinking, and our action, all in service to a vision that we actually have the competency to act on. Because a lot of time we, times we have vision, we have values, but we don't have the skills to consistently act on them. But as we practice, then we begin to develop those competencies. That is what gives us at least the foundation for both making social change but also for being with the natural environment, the, the, our, the, the nat, you know, in nature, uh, in a way where we are right-sized and are able to feel our belonging. I want to invite everybody for a moment just to take a deep breath. <sighs> and just let yourself feel, and this may be very intense, but we're in a practice of building emotional capacity. Feel. Let your body have its awareness of the impact of the fires that raged in the Amazon and in Australia. We talk about the Amazon as the lungs of the world. The lungs of the world were scorched, were destroyed. And here we are with a respiratory pandemic. That's a metaphor. I'm not claiming any scientific connection. And we are connected. When we expand, when we center in our with, it is not only our belonging with other human beings, we are centering in our belonging with all of life. Keep centering, keep breathing. Let whatever you're feeling be there. And invite gratitude for the depth of that connection, of that interdependence. We are enormously lucky to be able to bring awareness, to be able to feel this. I'm gonna go to the slide. And you'll notice that the title of the slide is Sites of Shaping, Sites of Change. We change as individuals through things like what we're doing here. We take courses, we go to therapy, we do body work, we change. In some ways, it's really up to us. 
anybody that's a member of a family system an internet network you know it's not as easy there <laughs> we change and then all of a sudden people start acting all weird and they don't know what to do and woof, much more work much much more of an engagement same thing with community the, the more we move out the more and more people have to be involved in making the change the more we need organizations and structures to engage whatever the issue is what we are seeing right now black lives matter movement the struggle around defunding the police and moving resources into really building strong communities that are able to that are taken care of and able to take care of themselves look how many thousands of people are involved look how many organizations you know it's not one person and in fact that's part of the myth of history i think that um part of my own personal delight with uh what's happening around confederate statues it's less around all oh, their confederates but it's around just even that approach to history this mythology that individual usually men created the world may i just say being totally in new york bullshit <laughs> bullshit all right so the world is made, the, 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 what we live in is created by all of us. This comes back to the issue around centered accountability. <laughs> um, I have a friend and I was saying something about, oh, you know, we are just, we are the, whatever, we're the death cult of the world. I was talking about how currently the pandemic is being handled by the administration of this country. And the person said, not we, I don't have anything to do with it. I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, you live here. And, and, and of course, we can be opposed to things, but either we're opposed and actively engaged in changing them, still we hold some responsibility. That's what I mean when I say we, we, the residents and citizens of this country, have some responsibility for how this country is handling the pandemic. How do we choose to live with our responsibility? How do we engage and connect with others to change the conditions, to change our communities, to change our institutions, to create new history that is not all defined by one megalomaniac? <laughs> so, sites of shaping, sites of change. Every single site on this chart we could talk about in some ways as a location of struggle. That there are always, there's a push pull, there's a tension. And we want to engage responsibly and responsively at each site, essentially through building the connections and collective structures that can actually produce new outcomes, can produce the new shape that we hold in our visions and in our values. So, hope that was helpful. Yeah. We're at 11.58. Yeah. Maybe just close out with a final mood check. Just drop it in the chat box. It's been a delight to be with you. Thank you for this time. I also just want to add that um, Thank you so much, Alta. This has been really insightful and really deep work. And for those who have not joined us for any courses we do, please check our website for upcoming courses in the fall. Um, we will have in every evolving calendar, especially during this time of COVID. Um, and Alta, right, we just love having you and can't wait for you to come back again and share some more of your wisdom. Oh, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to be here. All right. Bye, all. <laughs>